Genealogy is not about looking at the present, but it's about looking at the past. And with DNA, what better way to look at the past than to look at some archaic human DNA and how we match them. Howdy, I'm Andy Lee with Family History Fanatics, where we help you understand your DNA, climb your family tree, and write your ancestor stories along the way. One of the great things about DNA comparison is we can compare our DNA to other samples that have been taken as well. Now, some of these samples were taken from archaeological sites that are hundreds and thousands of years old. So let's dig into the archaic humans on the GEDmatch.com website. So here I am on the GEDmatch website, and you can see that as we go down in the DNA applications, these are the free tools that everybody has access to. Near the bottom, there is one called the Archaic DNA Matches. This is the tool we're using today. Now this utility allows us to compare DNA with lots of ancient DNA samples. If we go over to the webpage that's linked on here, then we can find out a little bit more information about each one of these. For instance, there's going to be the list of all of them, where they were found, what their Y DNA, what their mitochondrial DNA, how old that sample was. And if we go and we click on any one of these, we're going to see some information about them. So let me just show you a couple of interesting ones that jumped out at me. First off, Kennewick Man. For those of you who like archaeology, Kennewick Man was found in Washington or Oregon um, you know, a while ago. And it was interesting because this sample had some features that didn't look as Asiatic as what we'd expect from Native Americans. And there was a big controversy as far as who owned the remains and eventually the remains, I believe, were turned back over to some of the Native American tribes in that area for burial. But Kennewick Man's DNA is on Jetmatch and you can compare your DNA to Kennewick Man. Another one that I like is this Clovis Ansic. Now the Clovis culture was about 12,000, 15,000 years ago. And it was interesting because it's really, I think defined by some different types of arrow points that the Clovis culture used that the previous cultures had not used. And so it was a technological advancement. And these have been found all over the Americas as far as archeological samples. So you can actually compare your DNA to these ones as well. This tool is very simple to use. As you can see, there's just really two inputs. You need a GEDmatch kit number. This is one of your kit numbers or some other kit number that you have access to. And then you want to put the upper segment threshold limit. This is how much that segment has to share DNA to be considered a match. Now, normally we don't usually look at things below about seven centimorgans or 10 centimorgans even. But when we're talking about ancient DNA, there's lots of times for even those small segments to get chopped up. So we're gonna be looking at things much smaller than that in the hopes of looking at an overall pattern as opposed to a specific segment of that DNA because a lot of those segments are probably gonna be false. But what we can see is we can see some overall patterns. Let me start with a kit of my grandfather. Now he is primarily of English ancestry. And here is the list of all of those different ancient DNA kits. The orange is where we match and the gray is where we don't match. Now looking at this, it looks like, wow, there's some of these we match across the entire chromosome almost. Eh, not really, because I used 0.5 centimorgans, which isn't very big and there's gonna be a lot of false matches in this. So while it looks like, yeah, I've got a lot of matches here, it's probably not. So let's go back and let's change this to something else that might be a little bit more reasonable. So when I try 10 centimorgans, I get no matches whatsoever. And I wouldn't expect any from ancient DNA. There have been hundreds and thousands of years in some cases for this DNA to get chopped up in all the preceding generations. So the fact that I don't share 10 centimorgan segment with any of these ancients, not really a concern at all. It's not until I get down to five centimorgans that I actually have the first little tiny segment. And it might be a little hard to see if you look right above my head right here. There is a small segment that my grandfather shares with this 
NE1 from Hungary that was about 7.2 thousand years ago. That's it. That's the only five centimorgan segment that is shared with any of these samples. So we're gonna have to go even further to a smaller segment. At three centimorgans, I'm starting to see a little bit more and you can see that there is some more of this orange. In fact, there is this LBK from Stuttgart that there's several segments along it that are at least three centimorgans. There's this Lochbohr from Luxembourg that there's a few. I go down, there's one from Hungary that's got some. Um, one from Siberia that looks like it's got a couple. And then there's this other one from Hungary that had that five centimorgans that it's got some more segments now. So we can start to see a few little patterns emerging as to where some of these are. Now, from our known history as far as migration patterns, we know that the ancestors of um, many Europeans came up from the, the Caucasus or from Anatolia and eventually settled and eventually those people made it to Britain. And then Britain was you know, resettled over, over several millennia by different groups from that. So I would expect a lot of these Central European ancient DNA samples to match a little bit about some of my grandfather's English ancestry. And that's what this is showing. This is at three centimorgans. When I take this down to two centimorgans, you're starting to see more of the patterns emerge. And here's what I'm really looking at when I'm seeing this. One, I'm seeing, hey, this Stuttgart and Luxembourg and Hungary, these are all from that central European part. And so this is probably a much later migration that came over to England um, that my grandfathers descended from. On the other hand, one of the things I'm not seeing is I'm not seeing these from the UK. And these were most likely some of your ancient Celtic people or even pre-Celtic people that were living in the UK. These ones are 2,000, 1,300 years ago. So my grandfather's not from that. He's probably more mixed from this Anglo-Saxon invasions that happened later on based on these ancient DNA samples that I'm seeing. Another thing is while there's several samples from Sweden, which might be similar to some of your Scandinavian, you know, current years, I don't know for sure yet. Um, I'm not seeing really any of those in my grandfather's DNA. So it's just interesting. And again, we're looking for patterns. We're not saying that, oh, these are definitely and these are closely related, but we can definitely see that, hey, at two centimorgans, there's certain groups of these people from certain areas that have a lot more DNA. So now if I'm looking at the same thing, except with a different person, it's two centimorgans. It's looking at all the ones with two centimorgans, but it's with a different person. And as I scroll down, you'll notice that, hey, there's just this one little segment here from this Hungarian and that's it. And why is that? Well, it's because this friend of mine that I've chosen his ancestry is primarily from Sub-Saharan Africa. You'll notice as you're looking down at all these samples, almost all of them are from Europe. A few of them are from the Americas, but there's no samples that are from Africa. And so it sort of makes sense that, yeah, he wouldn't be because his genetic pool that he was a part of might not have migrated out of Africa and be represented by all of these samples. He might be part of a pool that really is just in Africa. And that's why there's almost no matching segments of DNA being shown on these segments that are from Europe. So here is another map. Again, two centimorgans that we're looking at, but with a different person. Now this person is primarily of Mexican ancestry and part of that ancestry is a mixture of Native American, of European and of Sub-Saharan African. Now we already saw that the Sub-Saharan African doesn't show really much matches at all. We saw that at least my grandfather who is from England, it has some specific areas that he matched. When I'm looking at this person of Mexican descent, we can see that, hey, the Stuttgart, that is one of the areas that also matched my grandfather and this person matches it in several places. The Luxembourg shows up there, this Hungary, and this other Hungary. 
But there's a couple of really interesting ones, and that's because of her other ancestry, her Native American ancestry. I mentioned earlier about the Clovis population. You'll see here that this person with Mexican ancestry who's got this Native American ancestry as part of that admixture, she has several different places that might possibly match with this Clovis DNA from 12,000 years ago. That's pretty awesome. And that's something that we would expect from somebody with Native American ancestry. Now, if we go down and take a look, there's also a few others. There is this Siberian one from about 45,000 years ago that didn't show up on any of the others. Well, most of the Americas were populated by people from Siberia and Northern Asia about 15,000 years ago. So this sample may represent part of that population's descendants. And we can see that she also matches in several places along there. There's also a couple others from Russia on here. And I go down to the very bottom to Kennewick. And I mentioned Kennewick was found in the Washington, Oregon area. And Kennewick, man, doesn't have any DNA that matches with this person of Mexican ancestry. But that doesn't mean that their Kennewick man is not a Native American because Kennewick man was here in the Americas about 8,000 years ago. So certainly they qualify as Native American. But what it means is, is the population that Kennewick man had DNA from might have completely died out. It just might not be represented in some of the current Native American populations of Mexico where this other sample is from. So it's really interesting to take a look at that. Now, is this going to help you with your genetic genealogy? Probably not, but this is really interesting to look at just from a scientific standpoint and from a, hey, overall heritage standpoint, when these scientists are uploading these different DNA samples, what DNA do I have that matches those samples? It's great, I like looking at this. Now, besides just looking at the total list of those ancient DNA samples. You can also use that with these other tools. So this is the one to many comparison. And what you can see right here is it looks like somebody else has actually uploaded the exact same sample because they're sharing 3,500 centimorgans and they've named it the Kennewick Man Research, but it's a different kit number. There's also some other ones that are clearly probably some um, ancient DNA as well. And just because of the size of it, like 23 centimorgans, I would not expect anybody modern day to, to share 23 centimorgans with somebody who has DNA that is 8,000 years old. Um, but there's also a couple when you get down into the seven or eight or nine centimorgans that look like they might actually be people today. Now, whether or not those are true segments, I don't know, I haven't done the research on that, but you can use these kits in the one to many tool. You can also use this in the one to one comparison as long as you decrease the amount of shared centimorgans down below that seven. And so here I've chosen three centimorgans as what it is. And this is being compared with the Mexican individual as well as the Clovis ancient DNA. You can see here on chromosome two, there's a couple that are in the three to four centimorgans on chromosome four, five. And if I look down, there's one segment here on chromosome number 14 that is six centimorgans. That's actually getting to a large enough segment that it might be a true segment, but you'd have to do some more research to see. But this is really interesting just because you get to see where these segments all play out. Now, maybe if you had a big population, you could do a study and there might be some scientists that are actually using the GEDmatch database with the ancient DNA in that way. I think it's just fascinating that nowadays you can compare your DNA with that of ancient humans. So if you'd like to learn more about how to use the one-to-one -one or the one-to-many tool, then click on these videos here. If you have any questions about the ancient DNA, put it in the comments below and I'll try to answer it for you. Make sure you subscribe to the channel and click on the bell if you wanna be notified about upcoming episodes.